so what's happening then in this process is that colonizers are not just trying to kill Indian people, but to kill our sense of even being a people. In addition to this, racism is a process by which certain peoples become marked as inherently dirty, as inherently pure, from which the larger colonial body is always trying to clean itself. And if we look at the history of native uh, genocide, we see again and again talk about the foster care, it ends up being that the federal mandate, as well as best practice, terminology, jargon that we use pretty interchangeably, but what that really ends up meaning is that the children should not be removed from their home and put in an institution somewhere if what their basic needs can be met in a family. So how do <laughs> pretty heavy agenda, but I think this is one of the uh, first times, uh, at least in my time in the legislature, that we've been able to focus on the issue, exclusively focus on the issue of foster care. And uh, I... Culture, what are some of the guiding principles in raising children? Uh, one of the key things is teaching your children, you know, their identity and the, and the entity as far as who they are. The, the child it's, uh, themselves, are, they're, they're a gift. They're a gift to us from God. There was a time when, uh, when I was growing up that I just hated my life and hated um, being in the world and the world that I existed in. And I think that stemmed from my experience of being in the in the Indian child welfare system. I think historically, in the United States, there was a view of Indian people that became institutionalized. And that view was uh, of deficient people in a deficient culture carrying out deficient cultural practices. And so while all of those removals were going on over the years, it was done with a sense that if you could remove an Indian child from all those deficiencies, from their Indian community, from their Indian family, from their Indian tribe, you were rescuing those kids. So many well-intended social workers felt like they were rescuing those kids from all of those deficiencies. They didn't want to talk about their legacy, that they've been upholding this quiet abduction of Native children. You know, they didn't want to talk about that. They didn't want to talk about that their biases has been removing our children at a tremendously higher rate than any other ethnic group. You know, no one wants to talk about that. No one's comfortable. No one's going to give a visual for that. And then those kids are lost. Indian children are rep over, still overrepresented in the child welfare systems. It's much better than it was before the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act, we think, but we don't have any firm data on that. Um, the overrepresentation over persists um, largely due to a lack of cross cultural understanding, misperceptions about the Indian family. That may be related to uh, stereotypes about substance abuse or poverty or, uh, or just uh, racial bias that's inherent in, in the world around us. So there's a history of mistrust between the tribal community and, and it's, it's a well-grounded history and a lack of trust of the state system. In 1609, the Virginia Company, in a written document, authorized the kidnapping of Indian children for the purpose of civilizing native populations through Christianity. In 1816, a congressional order was passed giving money to missionaries for the education of native children. These missionaries would soon become the most violent and abusive places, damaging children and families for generations. During the 19th and 20th centuries, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Canada's First Nation children were forcibly abducted from their homes to attend federally operated boarding schools as a matter of government policy. 
Sexual, physical, and emotional violence was rampant in many of these schools. The boarding school era began the decline of traditional family structures and the role of extended families to care for children within the communities. After the boarding schools began to phase out in the 1960s, a strategy of equal assimilation, lesser known, immediately followed in the school's wake. Numbers illustrate the fact that state child welfare systems merely replaced the residential boarding schools as a tool of assimilation by systematically disconnecting children from their families and tribes. The widespread adoption and out-of-home placement of indigenous children in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s would prove that Indian child welfare quietly picked up where the schools left off. In 1959, the Child Welfare League of America, in cooperation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, initiated the Indian Adoption Project, which led to tremendous rates of out-of-home placement that had really peaked in the 1970s. Uh, the thought of the time was it was simply better to remove children from those situations and to place children in, in uh, white families in urban areas. Um, Child Welfare League had the agencies and the homes to do that and Bureau of Indian Affairs had the children and uh, most of the children were removed without any kind of due process. It was just traditional within the social, within the uh, county social welfare departments, uh, just to come in and do sweeps and pick up kids, and uh, you can imagine the disruption in their lives, the disruption in their parents' lives, the effect that had on Indian communities. We had religious cults that specialized in setting up foster care camps for Indian kids. It was pretty much endemic in uh, California and throughout Indian country. Uh, that Indian kids were virtually being harvested, Indian infants. Basically, it was a parade of horrors. Since the age of two and a half, I was in the system in three different uh, foster homes, and it took me a long time to be able to uh, make sense of it all. Our family was separated, our family by the state, and we were put in non-native foster homes. Uh, the first foster home I was in, I was there until second grade. They wanted to show us a good life in the way that they knew. Um, they wanted to do well. They wanted us to do well. Well, when I went to the next um, placement, I remember not being able to walk in the house like everybody else, like we could only be in the living room like one half hour of the day. And the lady, she would, like under her breath, she'd like tell us we were stupid Indians and say things, just terrible things um, on a daily basis. And she would just, you know, look at us and um, say that we were like dogs and call us names and because of this stress and because of this all this um, abuse that was going on, I started wetting the bed, and I was in third grade, and and so then I got beat for wetting the bed, and so then it was just a cycle, um, and and so it wasn't until I became an adult that I realized, you know, well the reason I did that was because I was going back into a place where I wanted to be, which was safer for me and um, all of those things. Um, now, people would ask, okay, later I would even ask, you know, why didn't I say anything about all this stuff that was going on? And we didn't know that we could say anything. The caseworker was non-native and she just came and mainly talked to the the lady that you know was supposed to be taking care of us um, and they seemed to just have a social time and she didn't really talk to us at all um, we were just there well when I went to the next um, 
placement in comparison to the second it was very very good in some ways I think there was something that impacted my sister and I that um, was very abusive and that was that two of the people the male um, members of that family were uh, child abusers in terms of uh, well they were sexual sexual abusers and do we tell the caseworker this what's going on um, or and risk the chance of being put in another placement that's even worse um, or do we say nothing and just kind of put up with anything the best way that we can. So this is a big dilemma when you're a teenager growing up. And I, this all happened before the Indian Child Welfare Act came into play. There was absolutely no respect, nor sensitivity, nor even understanding for how Indian communities and Indian families operate with extended families. And so you, uh, somebody might have been an auntie within that tribe or that community's tradition, but the courts wouldn't recognize their role within the family. Uh, and But also, to get children returned to their parents uh, was extremely difficult because they were using traditional dominant society uh, values for what was a good home. Um, there was research uh, that sh during the 1970s, early 70s, by the Association on American Indian Affairs that showed that one in every uh, four Indian children was in out-of-home care or in, in that was foster homes or institutions, and that the uh, adoption rate of those children was 12 to 20 times higher than the, than uh, all other children. And when that was revealed, uh, it, it became very apparent that tribes could not continue to exist if their children were being removed from the, the culture and their communities at that rate. It's very devastating if a child grows up to be an adult and is not connected to their people and who they are. And so the act came into place to allow tribes to have uh, jurisdiction over how their Indian children were being placed away outside of their homes. Native people wanted the theft of their children to end, and with overwhelming evidence of children lost, the United States Congress recognized this concern as a human rights issue and passed the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978. The goal of the act was to strengthen and preserve Native American families and culture. Today, ICWA continues to set minimum standards for the removal of Indian children from their homes and gives tribes the rights to intervene in state court adoption, foster care, or termination of parental rights involving an Indian child. Now in 1978, we have the Indian Child Welfare Act passed. And it, it was uh, uh, sorely needed in California and certainly probably in the rest of Indian country. And overnight, we had a, a dramatic change uh, in that Indian families, Indian tribes, extended relatives had 
in many circumstances an additional tool at their disposal because state law was so much stacked against parents of kids who would go into foster care being involuntarily removed from the home. Tribes and, and non-parents had no rights whatsoever to intervene in these proceedings. ICWA does two very important things. Um, it's, it sets up a list of criteria that states have to follow when they take an Indian child into custody. And that's one whole set of things that, that, that ICWA does. The other major area, and I think it's at least important, as, if not more so than this list of criteria that states have to follow, is that it empowers tribes to run their own child welfare services, to set up their own courts, uh, to have their own child uh, abuse and neglect codes, their own custody codes, and to have a program that deals with those issues. Then the tribe doesn't have to follow the Indian Child Welfare Act. They have their own ordinances and laws governing family relations, and usually if, if the tribe is, if the person is in conflict with the tribe, then it's due to a tribal ordinance and, and a tribal uh, law, not the Indian Child Welfare Act. It, the state has to follow ICWA no matter what the tribe does. So when a, they take an Indian child into custody, they have to determine whether that child is Indian, to notify their tribe, uh, to offer the tribe the, the um, ability to intervene. Uh, the tribe can take juris request a transfer of jurisdiction if they want to, they don't have to. It's a very simply written law. It's deceptively simple um, because it, on the surface of it, it looks simple. Uh, in the implementation, it can get very complex. Because some of our tribes are matrilineal and some patrilineal, you can have a man from a, a matrilineal tribe married to a woman from a patrilineal tribe, and the, and the child will be full blood but not enrollable in either tribe because their parents are the wrong gender for their tribe. Um, some tribes have enrollment criteria that has to do with residence. You have to actually live on the reservation for a period of time to become enrolled. So it's not an act based on race. It's an, it's an act based on a political relationship. And Indian people as a group are the only group that has the, the kind of standing, legal standing that uh, tribes have. Uh, other racial groups don't have that political relationship with the federal government. If you tried to do that for uh, black children or Hispanic children or Asian children, it would be done on the basis of race. That's unconstitutional. Um, and even with American Indian children, if you are not a federal a member of a federally recognized tribe, ICWA does not apply to you. It, right now, with the implementation of the act is that we're still losing our kids, that um, getting states to comply has been difficult. The state courts have interpreted the act to read into it language that isn't contained there. And, and that doctrine is, has become known as Indian family exception. And where non-Indian judges have said that they are capable of determining whether the family's really Indian enough so that they fall under the Indian Child Welfare Act. Was their immediate family, i.e. their parents, Indian enough. And their parents may not have been Indian enough because they were in foster care placement or taken away from their parents. So now you just sort of compound that issue. Judges would ask, how many powwows have you been to? To determine if that was an existing Indian family. What do you wear at home? What types of Indian clothing do you own? Um, it's, it's, it's serious and your kids are in jeopardy. And this is this will determine whether you get your kids back or not. What's her connection to her Indianess or or the parents' connection to their 
their Indianness. And if they say, well, they, they lived in L.A. their whole lives. Therefore, that's not who Congress was intending to protect. They were intending to protect, quote, the real Indians. And those must be people who live on reservations and wear hair dresses or whatever their cultural conceptions are about who's an Indian in American society. Uh, ignoring the fact that those families moved to L.A. pursuant to specific federal legislation often. There was the relocation statutes that were passed by Congress uh, after World War II. Now the courts say, well, you're the second generation, so you're not Indian enough is, uh, again, one of the many ironies that uh, attaches to, to defending the rights of Indian kids. Some people would say those urban people in Oakland, not real Indian. But that's part of the Indian experience. A lot of Indian people got relocated. Other kids were adopted out and raised by white people and didn't find their way back until that's another Indian experience, and so there are just so many. There isn't just one. They just determined they weren't existing Indian families. These are not existing Indian families because they're urban. They're not an existing Indian family because that judge declared that they weren't Indian enough to be serviced through ICWA. So it's not for me, and it's certainly not for a non-Native judge to determine who is and who isn't Native. Because to determine who's an Indian is definitely not within the realm of a non-Indian. That's totally, that, that just flies in the face of sovereignty. There was no legal basis for that exception to come about other than the court system saying that we, uh, yes, the child may be Indian, yes, they meet the definition, but we, the court, just don't think there's been enough recent contact, so therefore we're not going to treat that child as Indian. I think that's, a, I think that's an indicator of that kind of um, bias. Institutional bias wouldn't be true of just one judge. So if the social services system is institutionally racist, what that means is racism is what's going to happen normally in that system. There, there are biases in the decision making at every stage of the decision making that, that are, uh, that tend to lean against the Indian family. That's why the Indian Child Welfare Act continues to be so important. Mm -hmm. Children and families uh, need different things depending on their situation, so n there isn't any law that can. Um, answer all the needs of a family. So uh, ICWA just really represents good casework. Um, it provides a framework to make good decisions for children. It remains difficult for state courts, county workers, and private adoption agencies to comply with the federal law ICWA, calling it unconstitutional and racist. From a tribal perspective, this is part of a continuing cycle of oppression in which children and families are mistreated by a system ill-prepared to deal with the consequences of historical genocide. Recognition and implementation of the Indian Child Welfare Act in state courts is not only important because it keeps Native children connected to their culture, but it allows family preservation and healing to begin. So if we were to talk about, you know, the whole process of the family and how important it is, um, this would be an example because now my son is learning. He's come into the world with culture and spirituality, and he's in a much better place as a teenager than I was at his age, and I think that's what it's all about. There were there have been a lot of people who taught me a lot, um, and and I would say that yeah, I um, 
gained a sense of identity and of belonging and um, there's been healing and eventually I came to the point to uh, say yes I will have a family I will have children and I'll be a good parent it's taken a l many years to be able to uh, talk about it many years to be able to heal and many years to be able to um, acquire the things that I didn't acquire culturally and spiritually when I was growing up. It would be nice if we didn't need anything like the Indian Child Welfare Act that we do and our families um, you know in whatever situation they're in uh, need the opportunity to be in a um, grow up in a way that will give them that foundation to be strong people.